Hear these words from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of the Lord. This past October, right around the time my mom celebrated her 99th birthday, or as six-year-old Gregory would say, began her hundredth year, she experienced a medical event that looked a lot like a stroke. Mom's caregiver called me with a video call and mom was leaning to one side and fairly incoherent. The caregiver called 911 and when they arrived and evaluated her, they decided to transport her to the emergency room. When she arrived there, she was cared for Immediately, her CAT scan happened quickly and then the waiting commenced. They determined about four hours later that she had a UTI, which can cause the stroke-like symptoms. They released her with medication for the infection and we started the vigil at home. Lots of details in the waiting, calls to the doctor, changes in medication, etc. She basically stayed in bed for 12 days. This is a woman who does not miss her daily shower and getting dressed, which most days is all she does besides eat and interact with the caregivers and rest. Oh, and her half hour of TV in the evening. Honestly, I began making more concrete plans for her memorial service. On Tuesday morning, the 12th day, she woke up and told her caregiver she was hungry and wanted to come downstairs for breakfast. Though it took her another week to come to her full strength, she did. We had a telemed scheduled with her doctor the following week and I went to the house and sat with her at the dining room table while we visited with the doctor. The doctor thought she probably had a viral infection as it turned out that the culture for the UTI was negative after all. One of the things that came up as we talked is that even when she was feeling better, she didn't feel like she could get out of bed without assistance. So the doctor prescribed an in-home evaluation and physical therapy as a follow-up. She just graduated from her PT course yesterday with flying colors. The therapists who have come to the house have been impressed with her progress. She is able to climb the stairs if need be and does laps around the dining room, living room area, and even showed me how she can up, do up to five squats at the kitchen sink. She's probably up to 10 by now. Five was last Monday. Her prescription going forward looks like this. She has exercises to continue, YouTube exercises that are PT approved, handles to assist getting into cars as well as a folding platform to help with car transport, a gait belt for when caregivers assist her with going up and down the stairs. Most of all, there's been a huge change in attitude in the last few days. So daily chores have been approved by PT folding laundry, putting away non-breakable groceries, simple meal prep, which she hasn't done in years, opening and closing drapes and turning lights on and off. Whew. Busy lady, as my sister texted me. Imagine that, an increased chore list in her hundredth year, because she can. Healing often, if not always, means change. Jesus has just left the synagogue where he has delivered a man from demonic possession. 
He went to Simon and Andrew's home with James and John and presumably Simon and Andrew as well. From the description, it sounds like there were multiple families living in the same space. Mark tells us, and Matthew and Luke also share this story, that Peter's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. The tense of the Greek word here for sick shows that she had been ill for some time. And the words with a fever could also be translated as fever stricken, and the tense used here implies an ongoing problem. The chosen video representation of this part of our scripture depicts Jesus' deep compassion for Peter's wife and the impact of Peter answering the call to follow Jesus. If you have a chance to watch this sometime, I would highly recommend it. When the fever left her, Simon's mother-in-law immediately got up and began attending to her duties, fulfilling her role in the household. The fever was gone and the period that usually follows for regaining strength was completely bypassed. Incredible! And that evening, the people of the town began to bring those who were ill and demon-possessed to experience Jesus' healing touch. Mark tells us that the whole city gathered together at the door. That's quite a picture. And we hear that Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. This first is the many, the first of many in Mark, which demonstrate Jesus' healing power and compassion. Some scholars refer to these verses as Mark's messianic secret. Jesus tells the disciples and those he heals not to tell about his healing acts. I've often wondered about this directive from Jesus. According to Bob Utley, a Bible scholar and commentator, Jesus did not want to be known only as a miracle worker or healer. These healing acts only pointed to his, resol uh, his role as Messiah, his calling to reveal the Father, to give his life as a sacrifice for sin and offer believers an example to follow. The healings and deliverances were only signs of his compassion for the weak, the sick, and the outcast. This compassion was also prophesied in the Old Testament as a characteristic and of the ministry of the Messiah. One other thing, Jesus did not permit the demons to speak because he did not want demonic testimony about who he was. Mark tells us next that Jesus rose very early in the morning, probably after a very late night of healing, and he departed and went out to desolate places, and there he prayed. The verb used here tells us that he was in the habit of praying. Mark only gives three examples of this, but Luke often repeats this emphasis on prayer. In our Tuesday night, study of the book called The Mystic Way of Evangelism, the author shares that one of the most important parts of sharing the gospel is emptying oneself of one's own sense of importance, one's own ideas of what another person should do or be. One empties oneself of ego, anxiety, resentment, judgment, logistics, desire, etc., and then one is able to extend self-emptying to all aspects of life. When Jesus lived his life on earth from a different place of power and connection to God, I believe his practice of prayer helped his humanity steer clear of self and stay focused on his mission to proclaim the news of the kingdom of God. Obviously, we are not on the, spiritual, the same spiritual plane as Jesus, gratefully. But we are called to bring good news of the gospel to the world. For that part, I say that Jesus' example of solitary prayer and focused attention on God's presence is a powerful and helpful example for Christ followers who long to share the gospel in an authentic way. When Simon and those with him found Jesus, they informed Jesus that everyone was looking for him. Logically, they assumed the next day would be more of the same. Certainly, Jesus had not been able to heal all of the people of the town in one day. Here they were to learn in practice what was mentioned already, that Jesus came to preach the gospel. Mark tells us that he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. The need for healing is a gift. It cer certainly focuses our attention on God. Think for a moment of how many of our shared prayer requests focus on the body and needs for healing. 
What about people who don't really pay attention to God at all until someone in their lives falls ill with something more than a cold? When a trip to the drugstore for an over-the-counter remedy fails to touch the problem, when the fever lasts for a long time and threatens the balance of the household, as in the case of Peter's mother-in-law, then one's attention turns to God. My own mother's illness certainly served to focus our family's attention on her care and her, our prayers in a different way. Healing can cause an openness to the Messiah's message in a way that hasn't been possible before. Healing causes change. Sometimes that is welcome. Sometimes it takes some getting used to. In the case of Peter's mother-in-law, she got up and immediately resumed her regular household duties. In my mom's case, the healing came and brought a question, a process, and finally a new way of doing life. Her healing will take some support from caregivers as she remembers the things that she is able to do and gets some practice doing them. That will be the process for her living out the healing that God has provided. Amazingly, this healing has brought a shift in her heart and attitude as well. Jesus came to bring the message of a new kind of life, a new relationship with God and the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth. Who he was, what he said, the acts of healing and redemption he did, including the death he died, his resurrection and ascension, all of these were the focus of his message. The disciples got to see Jesus face to face. They watched him heal and deliver and love and preach. They walked the final days with him and felt the grief of losing him. They were amazed at the empty tomb and slowly leaned into the truth of the resurrection. Even with all of that, they did not understand the depth of the gospel message. We have the advantage of being able to look at the whole story at once. We have the limitation of living without the physical presence of Jesus in the way the disciples experienced him. However, we are the same kind of people Jesus touched in Galilee, in need of healing, longing for compassion, ripe for deliverance of one sort or another. He is willing. It might mean change. It will take some self-emptying, so there's room and attention for the healing. Definitely calls for trust for the long haul and might even cause a shift in attitude. Thanks be to God. Amen.